Everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Oh, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listening. We all kind of have an idea of what it's like to be a movie star. You know, you sign up for a role, you work for a few months, you do a red carpet, and then they give you a big giant check at the end of it. But what's it like to be one of the working actors, the people around those movie stars, whether it's on a movie set or a TV show? You need a lot of people to do that, and they're called working actors. And today I'm joined by probably the epitome of a working actor. His name is Mike Houston. Uh, you've seen him in a ton of things, but you probably recognize him most from his work on Orange is the New Black. So we're going to get into what it's like to be a working actor, how he got into acting, and what it's like working with the likes of Kevin Costner and Joaquin Phoenix. Mike Houston, welcome to Good Listen. How are you, man? Uh, I'm good, Joe. How you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm super happy that you took the time to join me on this podcast. New York working actors, I know your your life is never a dull moment. You're always doing something, so I appreciate you taking the time. Anytime, man. Yeah, happy to be here, and I appreciate you reaching out and, and uh, wanting to talk with me, man. It's it's uh, it's fun. I love getting into this stuff. So awesome. Well, good. Well, first, I want to start with. Um, as you know, I'm a New Yorker, born and raised in the shadow of Manhattan. And so the idea of going to New York and pursuing a career, which I ended up doing, seemed pretty easy. I had to just get my ass on a train, go into the city, and all of a sudden, oh, look, I have all these wonderful opportunities available. But for Mike Houston, for young Mike Houston, it was the geography was a little further away. You grew up in Colorado. So let's go all the way back to that. As a kid growing up, in the mountain state, I think. I don't know. There's mountains there. I yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, mountain state um, for sure. How does a kid growing up there or, you know, spending their youth there make the jump to be like, oh, I I need to leave. Work. I need to leave my, my comfort zone and either go to New York and L.A. So tell me about those early beginnings and that choice you made. Okay. Uh, so it's quite interesting, actually, because it didn't <laughs> – my story is so strange. It, it in Colorado, I grew up loving acting, right? Like it's something I always enjoyed doing. I did the high school plays and the musicals. And then I went to the University of Colorado Boulder for college. And at the time, you know, I was still kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. And my uh, my dad and I had um, different visions of what my future might look like. <laughs> and so um, rather than continuing on uh, in the acting space, you know, I kind of went more into a liberal arts degree. Um, and so this wasn't really planned uh, at this point. You know, um, I ended up meeting somebody. This tends to be a part of the story for a lot of people. I ended up meeting somebody uh, during an internship my senior year in college. And uh, she and I uh, fell in love and... Um, I moved out to Massachusetts because uh, she was going to school out there at the time. And so I landed in Boston. And even then I was working, you know, nine to five jobs, just kind of going on that path of, of setting up and getting a house and starting that kind of world. Um, and then like all other stories, well, not all other stories, but most, uh, that relationship ended. Um, and I found myself kind of wandering uh, in a place that I wasn't familiar with to your point, man, I left, I left everything I knew back in Colorado. And, um, I was working for a company at the time when this was all going down and I didn't make it through that company. Uh, you know, cause life was kind of spinning and, and I was at this point, I was already 25 or 26. And, um, then, uh, the day I got fired, uh, from my job and the day I got fired, the first time I've ever been fired from a job. And I, I called my mom, you know, just to say, like, you're not going to believe this. I, you know, life is crazy right now. And it was her that said, why don't you think about, you know, trying acting while you're out there? She's like, I know you love doing it and you're young. And, and, and I was like, what the hell? Like, that's like the last thing I expected to hear in that moment. But Wait, she randomly brought up acting at that time? Were you doing any kind of acting in Boston? Not really. The only thing I did that she knew about was that I had, um, sorry, I, uh, I had tried this audition for like a theater conference, um, that was just kind of random. And it, it literally was like, I'm just going to try this cause it's out there. But, but that was also a year before she even, before this even came up. Wow. Yeah. And so my mom always knew, she always knew that I was this artist and this creative kid that, 
And I think she knew when I didn't make it through this kind of nine to five world, she just knew that that wasn't going to be my scene. Um, so her recommendation, like it changed my life, right? That's the, that's one of those pivotal moments that I will never forget was that day she said that to me because it did take some time to establish that footing for myself. But just knowing in the back of my mind that she believes that I can do this. You know, I took that, it took some time. I got into restaurant work uh, in Boston and- um, Getting you ready for acting, right? That's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely putting on a character as much as you can. Um, but then even then, I then I found myself working in some really cool restaurants and I kind of, I wasn't really doing much with acting at all. Um, it wasn't until probably two years, maybe a year, maybe a year after she said that, you know, I had another one of these moments where <laughs> I was reading the book Tuesdays with Maury. Have you read this book? Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a, what Great they call book. a, um, it's a tearjerker as they say. Yes, it is. And I found myself at my kitchen table in my apartment, finishing that book, a mess of tears. And I thought, you know what? I'm not doing anything here. My mom was even behind me getting into acting and I haven't touched it. I'm going to go back to Colorado and I'm going to start there. Um, get my foundation, you know, I'll be between, I'll be closer to LA at that point, you know, yada, yada, yada. But I, um, I, I promised myself that I wouldn't leave Boston until I did one audition. Um, because it was like, if I, if I really am serious about this, I, and the fact that my mom was behind me on this, I've got to, I've got to show her that I, I believe in it too. And you know, how that story goes, I auditioned for this community theater play. Uh, in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, called uh, for the uh, this community theater called the Footlight Club. Uh, the Footlight Club is is badass. It is it is known as uh, America's oldest community theater. Wow, very cool place. And we did this play called Psycho Beach Party by Charles Bush. I was a nervous wreck when auditioning. I remember doing, and I got called back for it. And I remember in the callback, I was holding uh, my sides. You know, when we're when you audition, you hold yeah your sides, and Good I part. was like. I was literally just shaking with the paper <laughs> while I'm doing the audition, but it seemed to work. Uh, and I got cast in the play and it was just so much fun. And it just kind of opened that door, you know, and I went from there into another musical community theater group that then led to me meeting this person, Lori. Um, uh, I, I don't want to mispronounce her last name. Sel Selmanary, I think it is. Okay. And, she was uh she and I did a, a crazy Sam Shepard one act play together, but she was working for a group called Boston Improv at the time. And she was the one that said, Hey, you should get headshots and and really consider this. And I thought, oh my God, yeah, that's a great idea. So I did that and got into the commercial casting world in Boston. And that's kind of what started the ball rolling. Wow. Um, with with being a professional actor at this point. And that now at this point I'm twenty like 28, 29. Um, and then through that year, I think it was 2004, I, I got some good plays and some good commercials. And then I got um, I got a movie role for a, a movie that was shooting in Boston. And I thought, wow, this is this is exciting. Like, I wonder, I wonder how far this could go. And then one day I get a phone call while I'm working at my restaurant in Boston and I'm working the lunch shift. And this woman on the other end of the phone says, hi, this is Dorothy Palma. I got an audition for you tonight at 730. Can you be at 27th and 7th uh, at that time? And I said, um, where's 20, Where's 27th and 7th? She said, what do you mean, where's 27th and 7th? She says, like, it's Midtown. I said, what? what's Midtown? <laughs> and she said, where, where are you? I said, uh, I'm in Boston. And she said, well, I'm, I'm talking about New York. She says, why do I have your information? Why do I have your stuff? And I said, well, because my friend Lori told me to send them out to all the agents in New York. Wow. Yeah. And so, and then she says, well, can you make it? <laughs> I said, I'm going to make it. And so I got on the phone with uh, my coworker, Matt, said, hey, man, can you come in and finish my shift? Jumped on a bus, four hours down, did a 15-minute audition for this um really interesting production it was like a non-union like 
kind of a complicated thing, but it was a uh, um, like an indie, basically. Yeah, well, even straight, it was a Bollywood, Hollywood co-production. A really fascinating story called wow. "Hope in a Little Sugar," and it it actually was a um, um a feature about a Sikh uh, general who was in New York at the time of September 11th and just kind of what he went through. Wow. After that, it was a really, really interesting story. I, unfortunately, I couldn't end up doing the movie because of scheduling and stuff. But what that did was it, I said, man, I just got hired for a movie for an audition in New York City. Yeah, so when I came back, like I went and did that audition 15 minutes and four hours back, eight hours on a bus, but I got the part. And so that kind of kicked me in the ass a little bit. And I made the decision uh, in the end of 2004, beginning of 2005, that I'm I'm going to move to New York City. Wow. You know, uh, I because I was like I don't have um, specific training. You know, I just go off my instincts. What I've been doing as a kid growing up. You know, but I knew that training would be super important if I really wanted to take this seriously uh, moving forward. And so I made the decision to move to New York City. And on June 1st, uh, 2005, uh, made the trek out here. Within a few months, uh, I was in a restaurant and, you know, just, just trying to figure out what to do. And thankfully, in New York City, every restaurant has every single artist you need, uh, great support groups, you know. And um, this one guy one day said, first thing you do, go buy a play every day, read a play every day, get some headshots. And my headshot photographer said, there's a studio here. It's kind of underground. Um, but a lot of great actors come out of there called the William Esper studio went applied, interviewed, uh, got accepted. And that, that's where it all really took off. Um, wow. and I was about, I was 29, 30 at the time. There's so many little like lessons learned there. I mean, for, well, first of all, the impact that women have had on your life, you know, from, oh from your God. mom to Lori, like, I'm just trying to, I mean, could, have you imagined like. What if these women were never in my life? What if my mom never supported? Me? What if I didn't Lori and who said, "Come on, yeah. go ahead, put your put, put put a headshot, send it down to New York." I mean, it's remarkable what these women have the impact they've had on your life. Have you have you had a minute to be like, "Holy shit, thank God for these people." Well, yes, but I never thought about it that way, and now you have me thinking about it that way, and then I'm like, <laughs> I'm thinking about my wife Jenny, who is absolutely part of this story and how impactful she's been with this career too, and I'm like, "Wow." I've got to do some retrospection about that because, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm the same way. Like, I will tell you, I I always say like the three women who who formed me were my grandmother, my mother, and my wife. Like, if I and I try to think about, and I always do the you remember the the Gwyneth Paltrow sliding doors thing. Like, I try to remove one <laughs> of those people from, my, and I'm like, there's no way I would be where I am if it wasn't for any three of them, the combination of them. So just seeing the yeah. way it played out with you and even even your your wife as well, it's pretty remarkable how that all went down. I, I want to. Well, and then if I can tell one more little story about it, yeah. Because now you've said that, I was like, oh my god. So what happened was when I got into the Esper Studio, a little later in that year, um, I was still getting emails from Boston um, from the Screen Actors Guild office there, and they had this casting that they were like, hey, we've got this open casting here in Boston, and the only way you can get an appointment is making a phone call between two and three. I was working with my scene partner in class, Victoria DJ, another woman. And I said, hey, Vic, can you get on the phone? And I'm going to get on my phone. Can we try to get me this appointment? And she got on the phone and got through, and I got the appointment through her. That ended up being the first TV show I ever was on called Brotherhood on Showtime. I got cast in it. That was another crazy moment where I had to go to Boston this time from New York. I went to Boston <laughs> on a bus auditioned the the woman carolyn pickman from carolyn pickman casting she looks at my resume she looks at my headshot and she says you're not from you're not from boston like where where did you come here from i said okay hold on i said yes i came from new york city i said but i was here for th six years and i said i was acting here for the last two and i literally just moved to new york three months ago and so anyway they let me get in there and then i go back to new york they're like hey you got a call back we need you in rhode island so I take a bus the next day to Rhode Island. Jesus. That for the director. I know it's nuts. And then, and this, there's a purpose of saying all this is that, and then I come back and as I'm coming back from Rhode Island that day, uh, I get the call from casting and they said, Hey, they want to hire you. And I, I mean, I lost my mind, you know, because 
one, I found out the day I was moving to New York that I was I could join SAG uh, because of that movie in Boston I got cast in. And then now I'm going to be on a TV show with Jason Isaacs and Jason Clark and Annabeth Gish. Like, people, wow. Ethan Embry. Like, it was mind-blowing. And I, I'm, one of the lessons I try to teach from that sometimes, especially to, like, clients and stuff when I'm doing consulting is, you know, it really is about putting in the work and and i don't think it's um chance that i spent all this time just to get to where i needed to be to show what i wanted to show and that by putting all of those miles in to just that passion right to say no I, i'll go wherever you want me to go because i'm going to pull this off um sometimes i have to really think back on that to because there are days man you know like get in a funk and you're like what am i doing why am i doing this and then i you know i remember stuff like that and i go you just got to put in the time and the effort and and you are of the prototypical new york actor you, i mean if you looked up your imdb you've been you've done a guest spot or a, a, a spot on pretty much anything that's filmed in the in the entire <laughs> in new york, yeah, yeah. In new york City area um but the one thing that we should mention for folks who aren't familiar with your work or probably and we're gonna get into uh orange is the new black in a second but the idea that you're a rather large human being so yeah, it, it, it limits you, I'm sure, to the certain parts that you can play. So I'm, oh, I was always curious about people that are, especially you know, character actors that you know, in a million years they'll never be the lead. They'll never be the boy that gets the girl. So I, I was always curious, like an actor like yourself, and, and not that you've always played character pieces, but like you, 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 you play a certain niche. Do, do you have to wake up with the realization one day to be like? These are the parts I need to go with. You have to be intentional about like what roles you're going after, or are I mean, because I guess you were still old enough. And, like I would think a young a young Mike Houston would just be spaghetti in the wall. Just I'm gonna try out for everything. But now yeah. that you're older and you've developed a persona, and uh, you obviously have the resume to back it up, are you now specifically and actively looking at certain parts? No, no, I am. Um, in fact, it kind of went the other way. Um, so when I first started acting in New York. Uh, you know, I was playing a lot of um, like law enforcement uh, because, you know, without the beard. Um, and I just I have that build. I have that look. Um, and I, I, I played a lot of roles. That's I was on. I did Blue Bloods, a bunch of Blue Bloods, um, uh, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, those kind of shows. Um, and actually, when I got uh, Orange, it was kind of fascinating because there was nothing in the character description about being big or the size. It was just more that he was kind of a. Lee Dixon was uh, kind of described as like just lazy. He's a for he's a veteran who's come back, doesn't know what the hell he wants to do, and just kind of likes the idea of free housing and free meals. Um, and so I kind of took those attributes of that character and thought about myself and going, well, some of this isn't that far away from what I what I kind of approach things as. Um, and then I got cast as Lee Dixon, and and then. Thankfully, I was blessed um, to have wonderful people surrounding us at all times and just super supportive and, and liked what I was doing. So they kept bringing me back. Um, and surprisingly, it was after Orange, you know, I, I was I've always been big. Um, but and yeah, I definitely, definitely, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat like the industry certainly saw me a certain way. And so a lot of my auditions would be for, you know, big guy or, or this guy's, you know, and I, I, I don't like the term fat. I think it's a, I think it's a dumb word because I mean, cause we use it the wrong way. Like fat is a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, when they use it in descriptions uh, for characters, it kind of drives me nuts. Cause I'm like that. It doesn't have anything to do with the character, but that being said, our business thankfully has also gone through some changes where you don't really see that as much anymore. Um, and I also think it's kind of played into why I don't have to worry about that as much anymore because a number of characters, like in this last, I don't know, three or four years, the the the, the things that I audition for, sometimes it's about it being a big guy, but um, most of the time it's about the kind of person that I tend to play, which is, you know, someone who's a little more sympathetic, you know, has a huge heart, you know, uh, is a very empathetic person. Um, I tend to go in for a lot of those roles, you know, and, or I'll go in for scary big guys, 
know? <laughs> but I don't, I don't try to target, you know, something for the big guy roles necessarily. Um, what I go for is the character driven, you know, what are they looking for in the character and what's the story? And I will see myself in that story and say, you know what, if we can get an audition for this, I would love to do that. But more importantly, it's my agents that, I, I, you know, I signed with a new agency some years ago, and when I did, they kind of changed that trajectory as well. They, they no longer just saw me as a big guy, you know, played big roles. They, they, they put me out for a lot of cool, different stuff, and I, I really, um, I credit that with why I was able to get, um, you know, after Orange, just some of the guest star stuff I did, uh, Chicago Med. Uh, NCIS, none of that had to do with my size. It really had to do with my heart. And so wow. it was really cool to go, okay, I think I'm kind of out of that uh, now. I mean, don't, again, don't get me wrong. I'm always going to get auditions for the big guy roles because, yeah. you know, the creator gave me this shoulder set, so I got to use it. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and don't get me wrong, it has also benefited me in the last, the two films that, you know, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, my size definitely helped with that. Um, but it is cool, especially in the last six months, the things that I've been going out for, man, it's awesome. Like it, it's so much more just about the character and the choices rather than this physical build. Wow. That's cool. Oh, God bless you, man. Yeah. That's great. Um, so you mentioned Lee Dixon and Origin Do Black. So tell us for folks that are not familiar with the, I guess the guest starring or the guest spot on a TV show and how it works when it becomes a recurring character and, yeah. So when you when you get the gig for Orange is the New Black, walk us through that. Like, are you expecting one episode, two episodes, four episodes? Because if folks remember Orange is the New Black, there was a lot of different narratives. So you you wouldn't see some characters for four or five episodes, and then all of a sudden they appear for three straight. So what's it like when you sign up for a show like that, and you're like, what wh- like what was the agreement at first? Like, how many episodes were you signed up for? One. One. Yep, I auditioned. Uh, I got the part, and. The only thing we knew was that I was going to appear in episode 401. Um, so that's, now, uh, that's season four, episode one, right? Season four, episode one, right. And when you take that, or maybe it was episode two. It was one of, was one of the first two. Yeah. And what happened is this was like, I think the first, well, the second guest star-ish role, like when I did Boardwalk Empire, same idea. You get cast you know you're working on one episode for sure that show was a little different like i really didn't know if i was coming back you know i i just took it as thank goodness that i get to be seen and be in this really cool show yeah and then you know hey they're gonna bring your character back because there's this story they like and then you know then you start as an actor you kind of start to see oh i i think i'll be back a little bit here because if if they're gonna keep going with like michael shannon's character in this world that's a good possibility. Whereas with Orange, um, you know, same idea. I knew they were setting something up. Like, I knew I was going to be a guard at the at Litchfield. Yep. I just didn't know how often. And and then that season, um, it was kind of a week-to-week, man. Like, I'd get booked for the week, do the shoot, and then they would call and say, hey, what's his availability for these dates? And... So it's oh, almost he's, like he's they're booking bit... dinner dates with you. Like they have yeah, no idea was... what's going on. Yeah. All of a sudden, hey, see if Mike's available next Friday. To fill... I mean, is it that sort of like happen? <laughs> like, like so just like slapped ass? Kind of. It's 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 because, um, and it also depends on the show too. Like our show is one of those shows where like the writers were writing it as we were shooting it. Wow. You know, like it wasn't. Now the the main characters, right? The series lead characters, they all have their arcs, and and the, they know what they're gonna where they're gonna start and where they're gonna finish. Um, but for the smaller parts, like the recurring guest stars, what I gathered was that, you know, they would write each episode and say, oh, we could put Dixon in this space. Um, and, and this way it forwards the story this way on this one character. Right. And so you just kind of. Again, you kind of trusted that I I trusted that reading these scripts, I thought, I, I think I'm going to be in this show pretty decent amount i just don't know how much and they and yeah they just didn't it wasn't one of those things where like hey we're gonna lock you in for a certain amount of episodes until later that did happen uh season five and season six is when they said hey 
uh, we're definitely going to need you for six episodes a season. And that's a, that's a, I'll, you know, not going to lie. That's a great moment as a New York actor to be told like, Hey, you're going to have a job for at least, you know, 10 weeks, um, outside of restaurants and bars. And I'll, I'll tell you, I was working at a bar in the city at the time, crazy sports bar. And, uh, I got the phone call about season five that they're like, Hey, they're going to, they're going to have you on for at least six episodes out of the 12 or out of the 13. And that was, that was another one of those. Like I had dreamed of this moment. I hung up the phone. I looked at the whole bar. This was about two 30 in the afternoon, four, three in the afternoon. I said, all right, route of shots on me. This guy just got his, <laughs> like got his, his, his flowers. And so it was just awesome. It was just like, and, and knowing, you know, and then from that season six and then season seven was, was, the, was just an amazing experience because that, that was the year they said, Hey, uh, we're going to, we're going to keep you for every episode this season. You know, wow. really, really, it was a, it was a really lovely gesture. Um, I, it felt like, uh, it just felt great knowing that they liked my character enough that they liked Dixon, that they liked what I brought with Dixon that they felt he was important enough to keep telling the story. And then in the last season, the the relationships that I got to to explore with with um Taryn Manning's character, Pensatucky, and and Daniel Brooks character, Tasty, like I got to explore relationships with them that had been building for some time. But I got to really delve into it like, you know, what we all dream of as actors is is to really get into the mix and 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 work with some amazing people. Um it was oh do I like working with her and you know and for you know when people watch the show you'll see me and her singing a tune in the last season that's really really kind of uh it really caught me off guard i was crying when i watched it um wow yeah that's kind of how it worked um and now it's just a matter of when i get the auditions it'll either be a guest star for a show like a chicago med which you're not going to really you're not going to recur on those uh, but you know, I I am getting opportunities for a lot of recurring different roles. So that's so cool. cool. Uh, now let me ask you because uh, we mentioned the how the, the happenstance of your character growing in in season four. But you ended up joining the show. I mean, let's people forget, and we're going to get yeah. into the the this sort of legacy of Orange. But it was a cultural phenomenon when yeah. you book that show. What was that pressure like to be like, oh man, I don't want to fuck this up because this show is. Huge. I mean, it's so funny. We're in 2024 now, and people forget how gigantic that show was. So what, yeah. what, what kind of pressure did you either put on yourself or maybe your friends put on yourself about, like, what you were getting involved in? You know, I didn't I didn't actually take it as pressure. I I, I was just super excited because I, 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 I hadn't started watching the show when it came out because um, I was in school. I was just busy doing stuff and working sure. at restaurants and, like— um, but when I started to watch it, I was like, oh, this show is crazy incredible. And so when I got cast in it, I kind of took it on as more of a a fun challenge, but also pr- I was proud to say, like, thank you for wanting me in this universe. Um, and so the only pressure I ever felt or I put on myself was like, wow, I'm about to walk into a show of an ensemble of women and, and men that, that have been together now for three years. And if I'm being honest, it was a little uh, kind of it was a little nerve. I was a little nervous the first day because you know, the way the show works and I, I hate to put out spoilers, but it has been out a while. So yeah. <laughs> I haven't caught it yet. Um, but you know, at the end of season three, all the guards that all the audiences have come to love um, because of the way the story was, was planned out that, you know, they were going to go to the private uh, prison system from a state prison system. So the state guards are all let go, which means all those actors are, are, not necessarily coming back. Some of them, you know, they, they definitely brought them back in where they could in the show. Yeah. But then they bring in this whole new crew of us. And it was pretty intimidating because, again, we're with these actors and these on, this ensemble that has been together and knows these people, cares about these people. And here we are coming and taking their jobs. And I thought, wow, this is nuts because it actually works um, in real and in fiction. Because in real, we are taking jobs from these yeah. old other actors and it really played well into the actual scenes. It wasn't not hard to feel resistance from the ensemble cast 
And I, I don't know if it was planned that way, but it worked out brilliantly. And then I just feel very lucky because season four of the show uh, was one of the most powerful seasons, I think, that they did. It 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 centered on, you know, the 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 themes and 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 um, overall uh, understanding of the Black Lives Matter movement um, about the carceral system, uh, the private prison system. And this was all at the time, you know, at the zeitgeist in our political discourse as well. Right. So I, I was very lucky to be on a show that, that really was taking on the present challenges of the moment in this country. Um, and in a very, very successful and emotional way. So I never really felt intimidated. I, I will say it took me about three episodes to really, well, and to also kind of endear myself with the other cast members to say like, hey, I get it, but I'm just here to make all of this better for you guys. Like whatever you need from me, you know, I'm not here to like, hey, I'm Mike Houston. <laughs> I can't wait <laughs> to kick ass. It's like, no, man, I'm here to I'm here to tell story and do it the best way that you guys think it needs to be told. That's so cool. Uh, let's fast forward to season five because to me that was one of my favorite seasons because that was the that was when the, the script got flipped and you you basically spent the entire season as a as a prisoner yourself. You were That's a right. hostage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What do you remember most about that season? Because I remember you, you got a lot of work that season, uh, being held captive. Any 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 highlights come to mind as you instead of being the guard, being a prisoner? Um, yeah, it was. Um, you know, it was fascinating. It was the first time. This is. This, I mean, it's kind of a crazy thing, but. I uh, I do appear uh, at one point in that season uh, nude um, during a very kind of really intense traumatic scene. Um, that was the first time I've ever had to do anything like that. And you know, they did. They asked me at the beginning uh, before we started shooting. They said, "Hey, just so you know, this is kind of in the plans. Are you comfortable with that? We can also do a body double, you know." And I just said no way man i was like the women do it all the time for this show you know yeah. and it's important to the story so i said i'm not i i want to do the best thing i can to to tell this story the best way and the most impactful way and that was one way to do it um and man you talk about having a trust um but what a great moment for me because it also gave me some confidence to say like i have autonomy in this you know i can say yes or no but I choose to do this because it's important for the story. That being said, also then being stuck in the prison system, you know, as the, as the, as a guard, a lot of the memories are just funny ones. Like the fact that I had to wear this moo uh, <laughs> almost the entire season was great because man, you know, put on the uniform is it's, it's lovely. It just takes a little time. And sometimes those walkie belts get a little heavy, whatever. And a moo moo, man, I'm just like, this is the most comfortable job I've ever had. I can just walk around in my moo moo all day long. Um, I got to sing in that season because we did that, you know, Litchfield's got talent. So I got to actually show people that I, I actually do sing and I love singing. Um, but it was a banana. You're right. It was crazy because not only was it that we were prisoners in the prison, this was the first season and only season in which they decided to do a 24 hour story oh that's right over an yeah. entire season right and it was a really it was a little jolting for a lot of fans too because it was like you know we're used to seeing time jumps and you know stories that kind of last a long time and then this one goes in 24 hours but over you know 13 episodes wow. um it was it was a lot of work um but i thought the payoff was great at the end you know yeah. again just again to say like what do you expect from a system that just destroys and beats down and just gives no credit credence or anything to these women like all they wanted was to be respected and thought of and you know the the, the driving force was when Poussey you know left us uh, oh god back, yeah like just saying her name like just say her fucking name pardon yeah. my language sorry yeah no it's fine <laughs> Um, uh, no, no, uh, fantastic! Thank you for giving me an insight on that because, like I said, that yeah, was probably yeah. one of so the that's, best. That, that season was cool because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about the legacy of the show. Like I mentioned, this show was a cultural phenomenon, and yeah. to, and this could be my personal opinion. I feel like the show ended on such a downer that last season. It really concentrated heavily on the immigration storyline 
And like you said, the show was very topical. It was, it was almost like the law and order of serialized shows. It was ripped from the headlines. And I don't know if this is just me, my view on it, but I feel like that downer of a season sort of has affected the legacy of it because you don't hear about Orange in the GOAT conversation. You don't hear it in the, you know, the Breaking Bad, even the Boardwalk Empires or Sopranos conversations, where at a time it was going to be on that GOAT list. Yeah. What do you think about the, the legacy of the show? And again, this is just my personal opinion about that last scene. I still love the yeah. show, but I felt it was, it, was, it was a bit of a downer from wh where it was heading. So tell yeah. me about the legacy and, and how you feel the show wrapped up. Um, I actually, I, I liked that it wrapped up the way it did because I think it was important to say as many strides that have been made in what we see and how these relationships with the system work. You know, by the time we're in the last season, now we're in a maximum of security prison. So it's a whole, it's another um, level, another insight to what it's like to be a woman in this situation and how it's treated. And, and then to your point, like they brought in the ice um, storyline. And I actually thought that was incredibly impactful. Again, to your, kind of what you said at the moment, at the time, that was definitely in the headlines. And so the writers wanted to use that and yeah. say, we're going to show you another aspect of being a woman in the system but this time these are women that aren't even criminals but they are because they're considered immigrants that are here illegally you know and i thought that was a fascinating way to explore that and i i liked that it didn't wrap up with like the joy because that's the truth you know what happens to tasty at the end of this show is heartbreaking yeah and it's intentional because it's you're not I don't think I don't think they I don't think they wanted us to leave saying, oh, good. OK, Piper's lived her life and and oh look, Tasty's out and 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 Cindy's out and, and you know, Uzo's taken care of like, you know, uh, Suzanne and like, no, no, they're all still there. And and until we as a society speak up a, more against private prisons, which we did because of that show. And yeah. because of that show, I really believe that, you know, there the the idea of private prisons now is is a very touchy and and it's going the way of the dodo bird. Because people are aware of it and saying right. you're literally making money off of human beings and you're capitalizing on it, rather than are we really trying to restore to you know get restorative justice in the system? Um I, I do hear what you're saying because you're right. It was it was a downer. It was. I feel like as a typical TV viewer, you always want that show when it ends to end on an up note. But I guess you're right. I mean, in a way, it was true to itself that it was. This is like, like you said, they weren't going to get out of prison and have all careers and have a happy ending. So I get that. But I wonder if that. Do you think this is me again? This is me surmising. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that because of the the feeling that the show that the finale left, people were like. Oh man, I'm sort of down, and I don't, I'm not going out. It's like, oh my god, this is the greatest show ever. Maybe it's just the emotions of that se the season p p plays a part. Could be. I, if I may, I, I do have a theory, and uh, <laughs> maybe controversial or maybe not. But you know, all the shows that you mentioned earlier, uh, Breaking Bad, uh, Boardwalk Empire, you know, major uh, Lost. Let's even go there. You know, uh, were male dominated, male written, male directed, uh, male produced. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. There were definitely female. I had a couple female directors in in uh, in those shows, but I I think that you know this show wasn't elevated because you know in the in that space it's it's male dominated, and this was right. a show that was literally focused on told the stories of and and refused to give way to anything else other than keeping the women in this story front and center. And, and again, from top to bottom, from the creator to Genji Cohen, you know, to, to Lisa Vinicor, who was our showrunner uh, for years and, you know, and to all the actors, like a female driven, female written show. And I actually, I think that that has something to do with why it didn't necessarily get into that. Cause at one point you're right. It was in the zeitgeist. It was huge when it first came out, right? Rolling stone covers and all of that stuff and, and incredible ensembles. Um, but again, it's a seven season long show too. So it 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 had a, a lot of shows don't make it as long as ours did, you know. Yeah. 
So it definitely had the longevity. And and I also think that just the changing landscape of streaming at the time, you know, I think there was an opportunity maybe for another season or even, you know, there was one time there was a, a, a rumor that, that maybe there'd be a film, you know, after this. But I, I think that just the way the streaming kind of uh, landscape worked out, like Netflix kind of went on and did some other, you know, they just kind of refocused on some different stuff. Yeah. Because if you'll notice... At the time, you know, Netflix was putting out, they put out House of Cards, Orange is the New Black. Um, they started with that show called Lilyhammer. You know, they, right. they were the, they really broke the, the, the glass ceiling of, of what you can do with a, a, a streaming network and television uh, and produce shows. But then after those years, um, I think, you know, Netflix decided they wanted to do their own studios. And because and like we were produced with Lionsgate, we were, we were a Lionsgate show. It right. was licensed to Netflix. And then once Netflix realized, like, hey, we can just kind of make our own stuff, um, you know, at that point, that's when things kind of change. Yeah. Um, but then Genji went on to help produce, you know, the show Glow, which was an outstanding show. Again, uh, female-centered, focused. Uh, I loved that show, and I honestly believe the only reason it didn't make it was because of COVID. Um, I think that show would have lasted another, you know, four or five seasons as well. But I, that's my opinion. I, I think it, I think that that might be one of the reasons. I, and I appreciate not on that. the Reddit's, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and here's the thing: like, I get, and I think that's one of those shows that maybe you know, ten, twenty years from now, we'll get that legacy sequel, like you I mentioned, so, yeah, where they the way they bring it back. And you know, and one of the things you did, you mentioned there about the ch- change in Netflix. Netflix went away from those seven season shows because, of course, you know, it's all about data and analytics. They don't want shows to go on that many seasons. They'd rather have new series as opposed to more episodes of a show. So that model changed. So you guys were lucky enough to get in because you probably yeah, do more exactly. black now. You probably do three seasons, right? Right, two or three, probably. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And and I, I mean, I don't, I don't fault that idea either. I, I think sometimes storytelling is great if you can condense it and get into two seasons. It's awesome. Yeah. You know, but then you have like fantasy shows and and things like that. Like those are the shows that I see. Yeah, I can see why you want eight seasons because especially if they're based on books that are, you know, a thousand pages long for one yeah. chapter, um, you know, you're just going to take time to tell that story. Yeah. But uh, you know, yeah. I want to pull, I want to talk about the changes in the landscape too, because you mentioned uh, working for Netflix and you've done obviously a lot of broadcast television, as we mentioned. Uh, one of the, one of the um, sort of sticking points of the strike uh, that occurred uh, earlier this year was the fact that the, Netflix model doesn't allow for royalties to actors because I, the, the old school actor who appeared on a show in the 1980s that would get rerun to death would get what they call mailbox money in perpetuity with Netflix. What they do is and correct me if I'm wrong, they pay more up front so that in the so that in, in a way they're covering royalties in the end. So as a working actor, do you still get anything from Orange the New Black as opposed to shows that you're doing for for broadcast? Tell me about how that works. Uh, no, I do. And, and it actually changed, uh, strangely enough after season three. Um, okay. The, that was the model I believe at the time. Cause I, I, I learned at that time that like, yeah, they would, they would offer the actors like this big chunk of money. It was almost like a, like having a bonus at the end of the season. And, um, it would say like, here's the money. This will cover all the, the royalties and the residuals. And then they decided to go away from that and then went into, at that time, the SAG contract model. And so, uh, you know, I've been, I, I get residuals uh, for Orange Duty Black um, still to this day. Um, it's a different model than broadcast television. Um, but so it's not the same increments of money. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's less. Uh, but because of the, the union and because of, you know, how hard they've worked over the last decade to keep this streaming stuff from, you know, getting away from us. Um, they did a deal actually specifically with Netflix uh, in the summer. It was like two years before this last uh, negotiation when we struck. Um, and they did like a specific contract with just Netflix. And that contract did have language in there, I believe about the residuals. Um but now, because of the new contract that we finally got, um, uh, thank you to, you know, Duncan Crabtree Ireland and Fran Drescher for busting their asses to get us this deal. 
um you know we're we're the next time i get on a netflix show like uh, an orange and black that's a hit you know they have that they have now we have a bonus system too like if it's a oh, hit wow. show great um anybody that's involved in that hit show that's making you millions upon millions of viewers and dollars like are going to get a little they're going to get you're going to get some of that you know sweet um but you're right like there's and it's always been network tv the residuals are way different but that's it's because of advertising too you know that's where the money comes from at syndication um, and you know, running on exactly. the, and see know, that's I, the other I, weird thing. Syndication's I, I, over. And do you get Law and Order checks because that show is running? I think right now somewhere. Uh, yeah, like, do you, I, I do get you them a random Law and Order check every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. You know, like I said, I get I get residuals for pretty much everything I've ever done. Um, I did do a Law and Order, like let's say back in February. I think I did a Law and Order, and um, you know, I was actually surprised. I did get a a, a, a rerun residual. Uh, for primetime television, I thought I didn't know they did this anymore. No, nice. I, I seriously thought there's the syndication really doesn't ex- exist the way it did at all. You know, uh, that's that's kind of gone. And so, you know, that being said, let's say uh, let's say Paramount Plus or or one of these streamers says, you know what, we'll take Orange and redo it. We'll we'll put it back out there, but with commercials, right? That used to be the syndication model where it'd go on cable and you'd right. do it that way. Now it's on streaming. So, you know, there's always that opportunity. Um, but yeah, you, you still get you get residuals. It just kind of depends on, to your point, which way you did the show. Was it streaming? Was it network? Was it on someone's, you know, if I'm on direct TV and I go to channel four and Law and Order's on live, you know, you're not on Peacock. You're literally on the cable. So it's it's very, very up and down. But I just thankfully I'm just thankful that I get, uh, you know, a little something from all the work that I've done, you know, for all those years. So that's awesome. I love hearing yeah. about that. I love I love hearing about mailbox money and these uh, you hear from, you know, peep musicians, uh, obviously actors, yeah. as we've been discussing. But let me ask you this. The most random and tiniest residual check you've ever gotten <laughs> is one because I know some of these are actually pretty comical. What's the smallest one? One penny. Uh I'm trying to remember the show. I oh, I think I think it was this show. I did the show so long ago. It was called Canterbury's Law. It was on Fox and it was on for a hot minute. Um, but it was uh, I did get I, I got a residual check from that show once for one penny, and I just thought I appreciate that the system is working. That they are everyone the all the money's accounted for, and they're saying, well, he does get this penny. He was, but then I was like. How much did it cost us to send me that check? Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we're spending money to give me a, a penny. I'd rather that penny put it in a fund, uh, you know, an actor's fund that, that we can use for unemployment, <laughs> you know, things like that. Did you cash it? What did you do with that one penny check? Well, <laughs> so I have direct deposit. So oh. it just, yeah, it went right <laughs> in my bank account, baby. Um, you know, I don't know if you knew this. There's a, I don't know if it's still there, but there was a bar that I'd heard of in LA called Residuals. And you walk in and there are checks lining the walls of like five cents, two cents, like from all these different actors. Oh my God. I One know. As it is, I, it's, it's a little silly. All right. So speaking of law enforcement roles you're playing, uh, this fall, you're about to be another role law enforcement. Uh, you're playing a guard in the Joker sequel, a movie yeah. I think many of us are like, Oh no! Don't ruin this. The first one was amazing. What are you doing a sequel for? Um, and I know there's spoilers of plenty, and I don't want you to spoil it. Not that you would, I, but I tell can, me yeah. about what it was like to be on that set. Uh, whether it's around Lady Gaga, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, with Todd Phillips, like tell me about the vibe and what it was like working on that. Look, it it was an amazing opportunity uh, for sure. Um, the movie is going to be incredible. I, I'm I'm going to just stand behind this i know people are are, might be a little nervous but do not be nervous because it's todd phillips is such an incredible visionary director and artist um that's one thing i took from that experience more than anything was that this guy when he has a vision it's just it's really special um and so it's gonna blow people's minds um, and it's absolutely going to fit the narrative that we came from, you know, with Arthur Peck and the last one continuing on. Now I didn't actually ever get to work with Lady Gaga. Uh, you know, if I'm being honest, my experience on that film was a little crazy. 
Um, you might actually not even see much of me in it. Uh, when I was cast as a, the guard, I had a very specific look at the time. And when I got there, um, you know, first day of rehearsal and costume fitting and all that stuff, uh, for some reason, they uh, they took me to hair and makeup and they they shaved my beard. And, um, you know, I, I just kind of took it as like, all right, you know, I'm going wherever they tell me to go. And, and so they shaved my face. And then uh, when I got out of that, I realized I was late to a, a little meet and greet with Todd, with the other guards. And I thought, why am I, why am I not with those guys right now? So I go over there and I could tell someone was kind of crazy because he was talking to each one of us like, hey, it was so good to cast you guys. And like, he would look at each actor and be like, man, I loved you in this. And man, this was, and he hit me. And he, he kind of took a, a beat. And I realized later that he didn't fully recognize me in the moment because when I, like I said, I had this beard, a beard, and I look very different without a beard. I look baby face. I look super young. Um, and that did not fit the vision anymore that he had. Wow. Of this character. Um, and I, you know, I came to understand that some weeks, a few weeks later, you know, I was, I finally kind of found out that, yeah, it was a look thing. And, and, you know, I don't know why it happened or how it happened. Um, I am thankful for the experience to be able to say, like, I got to go on a Hollywood set. You know, one of the coolest days was, you know, the first week we'd get on the van from our hotel and drive up and I'd look to my right and there's Universal Studios lot tour um, that I used to take as a kid with my dad when we go to California. Wow. And so to be like, I cannot believe I'm about to get out of this van and go into a studio to shoot a movie with Joaquin Phoenix and Todd Phillips with Universal Studios right next to me. And as a kid, I knew that's what I wanted to do. You know, so they're amazing experiences. But yeah, I'm just going to come out and say, you might not see me a lot in the film. They did try. I think I think Todd really tried to find opportunities for me. Uh, so I do hope that uh, you'll see my face a couple times in that movie. Um but the good, at the end of the day, man, my name's in the credits, and uh, the residuals will go to that guy, Mike Houston. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a feeling it's going to be more than a penny. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be more than, I hope it's more than a penny. <laughs> um, no, it's going to be an outstanding film. And how about Joaquin? Um, for outsiders, he does give off this, like, a bit of an odd duck vibe. Uh, what did yeah. you see? Just, I mean, I, I mean, again, not going into what he did or what, like, what, what is his personality like on the set? Is he very method where he's basically Joker yes. all the time? Yes. Wow. Yep. He was, he was, he was always Arthur Peck. And it was incredible to watch. It was incredible to be around. You know, it was the first time I've worked with a lot of, a lot of, you know, big actors and, and a couple method guys, you know, for sure. And they all are committed the same way. But to see a character like that and to watch Joaquin, he just, he, it was, he was always in it. And, you know, I think I can say that like there were times where Todd would call cut and you'd hear, you'd hear Arthur laughing, like do like that uncomfortable Joker laugh and realize that like he, that's, he's, that's him. Like that's him. And I, you know, there was, there was another day that I was in um, hair and makeup and, you know, he came in to the trailer. I'm not exactly sure what he was, as what he was getting from the trailer. Cause I, in my memory, he literally came in and just kind of walked through it and then walked out the other door. But the stride that he had, the way he carried himself, I was just like, that's the Joker. Like he, it's him the whole time. So it's, wow. it's a really crazy, fascinating thing to be around because it also gives you permission as an actor to play with that too you know i'm i'm not a method actor personally um it's not my foundation but what it does do for me is that well i can as long as i can treat that that person as arthur peck the entire time so let's say we're not on camera i'm gonna be mike houston talking to arthur peck right and then it gives me insight so that when I play, you know, the guard, how I see Arthur Peck in that moment, too. It was just it was a really, really interesting and exhilarating thing to be a part of, because, again, he never breaks. Um, and, it, and it just keeps you in it, too. 
you just you don't lose the energy because it's, if he's in it the whole time, off camera, on camera, you don't have the opportunity to kind of get away from that. It was it was wow. it was incredible. Now I'm just curious as a guy who's made a pretty good living as being the quote unquote guest actor on a show or doing a, a spot in a movie. Can you try to like show me what like the dynamics like are on set? Like if you go on a, whether it's a, a movie or a TV show and like the the quote unquote star is there, whether it's you know James Spader and Blacklist that you've done or any of the guys mm-hmm. at FBI or Law and Order, do you is there any like chatty like do you go up and like hey how you doing I'm Mike Houston nice to meet you I'm from Colorado <laughs> I mean, do you, oh, yeah. is, what 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 happens there. Yeah, that's 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 almost exactly what it is. You know, when I get when I get a job and I come in and we're about to do like, you know, first rehearsal or we're doing a table read or whatever, yeah, you, you inter- I introduce myself and Mike Houston. Um and and usually, you know, I've never I've never had a bad experience with uh an actor um in that in that regard. Um most everybody has been incredibly receptive to us being there, um, you know, as a guest, uh, or as like a smaller role in a movie. Um and and I'll and I'll say too, like I'm talking like some of the biggest people out there are some of the nicest people I've ever. Like Tom Hanks is exactly what you think he is. Like that guy is gold. He was the nicest guy. Like you talk about how it goes down. I walked into the holding room, and there's Tom sitting there reading a book. He looks up and he says, "Well, hello. How you doing? I'm Tom." <laughs> and it's just amazing because you're like, we all know you're Tom, but the fact that like you are a human being that, and I'm a human being, and this is kind of how human beings introduce themselves to each other. You know what I mean? It was very cool. And then, you know, he said, what, 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 was, that? what, what was that? What did you do? Work with uh, Tom that Hanks? one was uh bridge of spies. I had, oh, wow, I had literally Gilbert. one or two lines in that movie, but it was very cool. It was a very impactful moment in the film. Uh, I'm really proud of that movie actually. So you um, got directed by Steven Spielberg. I did. I did. Holy and he got, cow. yeah, I'll never, I'll never forget the day, <laughs> the moment he said, now, Mike, and I was like, what? <laughs> Steve oh, Spielberg just said my name. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, and I've all, I've often heard about Spielberg that he's very like sort of like loosey goosey with rules when it comes to actors. He's like, yeah, let's feel this out, like because he's prepared so much in his brain that he's able to improvise on the set. W- was is he like that, like in real life, where he's just like, yeah, well, do I, I, I don't do know loosey goosey is the the term I would use, but he. Well, okay. First, you know, you're working with Steven Spielberg, so you're not really questioning anything he's doing and how he wants <laughs> right. to set anything up or set up the the the, the set. Um, but no, he definitely he he does there's a lot of talking with the actors, kind of like understanding, like, hey, what are we trying to get here? What is the shot about? All that stuff. Um, but he also had I don't want to say it was a tight set, but it was a very um, well thought out you know, film. I, I've worked with some directors where it's like, you are kind of improving and it gets a little messy um, and it can kind of make days longer. Uh, but his was, uh, he knew what he wanted, but, and, and, you know, he, he would just give you a few little things to, to try for sure. For sure. He'd throw something and say, why don't we try this? And then, but, but yeah, never like the only, the only thing he said to me that <laughs> was, was that um, at one point my accent went Boston for some reason, and this is a movie that takes place in New York, and it, he goes, um, "Mike, can we do that again?" He's like, "I, I don't know why, but you you definitely going you sound very Boston right now." And I was like, <laughs> "That's hilarious." I said, "Yeah, copy, copy, guy, you know." Um, but yeah, very, very cool. Got How it. in tune must a human being? Because I'm sure to you it was probably like. Maybe slightly, but it's not like you went, you know, pot the cod and Havad Yad kind of thing. But the fact that he's so attuned to what's happening could to pick it up on a take, that is just remarkable. I think it's because the line I had was, why aren't we hanging him? And the art, why aren't, oh. why aren't. And it's so funny because, like, if you do something, if you do, like, a, you know, a Long Island accent or, a, a, let's say, you know, Northern Queens, it's... It, that in Boston can get real close, you know, and so, but he caught it. He absolutely caught it. And and it was cool because I was like one word and he was like, that sounds Boston. And he was right. Wow. Well, let, let's nuts. wrap this up talking about working with one more legend, a movie that's another movie coming out this fall is um, Verizon with yeah. Kevin Costner. And as many people know, this is his passion project. He basically 
put uh, Yellowstone on hold and said, hey, guys, you got you guys missed your, missed your window to film this this last season, so I'm going to go do my movie. Um, what was that experience like? Um, I'll come out and say it's, it was the greatest film experience I've ever had. Greatest, greatest experience. One of the greatest experiences as an actor I've ever had. That Bridge of Spies experience was incredible. Uh, I've got stories for days about that. But this movie, I mean, you know, I've been doing this since 2005. And to finally have an opportunity where they're saying, hey, we're going to fly you out to southern Utah for three weeks to shoot a movie with one of the few remaining movie stars of my time. And then to show up and he's so generous and so thoughtful and so kind as a director and so specific and visionary in what he wants. But also he doesn't like he doesn't hammer you or. Or tell you you're doing something wrong. He just he just helps you kind of get to where he needs you to be. And he was God. He would bring us to the monitor to you know we call it video village. He bring us to video village to watch. And you know it was a very intentional move. A lot of directors don't want actors to rewatch scenes that they're doing, but he wanted us to go and see and make sure we understood what he was trying to get. And then man, he would give you the. I mean, I'll never forget. We're watching a take. He smacks me on the knee. He goes, "Great job, Mike." You know, and wow, I grew up with this guy. I've seen every film he's made as an actor and a director. Like, it was incredible. Um, and to know that this is a passion project, right? To know, and at this time when we were shooting this, there was not a studio attached. This was his money. And so the set was one of the most relaxed sets I've ever been on. Because you don't have producers or people, you know, kind of going hey we got to move on we got to move time is money time is money he's like the time is my money and i will take the time i need to get the shot i want he did there was this one day it was incredible we were sitting around we sat around for about five hours one day we were just kind of like and it wasn't a big deal because nobody was hustling or running around we were just kind of curious we're like i wonder what we're what we're waiting on and it turned out that there was this shot there was a cloud that was covering the sun in this one moment and he really wanted to get this shot of this sun at this moment. So he just waited Wow! for the clouds to go. And I thought, that is awesome. <laughs> that is so much freedom. And then when you're looking around and nobody's running around like a chicken with their head cut off, it creates a whole calm environment. So we all just hang out, talk to each other, get to know each other better. And I mean, I worked with legends in this film too, man. I got to work with Reed Burney. And Reed Burney, this guy, he won the Tony uh, some years ago for a play called The Humans. And I've loved this guy as a stage actor for a very long time. And then to see him there and to be able to talk to him about the Tony and and, and that play. And, and uh, oh, this guy, Andrew Howard, another phenomenal actor that I had seen in the show called Perry Mason on HBO. Yeah. I even told my wife, you know, when we watched Perry Mason, I said, Who's that guy? I, I that guy's. On, I hope I get to work with him someday. And literally, five months later, I'm in wow. a hotel and he's walking down the hall, and I'm like, "Oh, I can't even believe I'm working with you." Um, great, greatest experience. Just and and you know, in May in Utah, beautiful country, and we're and it's a western. I get to do a western. I got to wear the clothes. Who doesn't want to do western? You know, as someone that grew up here. Awesome. That's great. This is all great. Stuff. Mike, I could, I could talk to you for hours, but I want to let you go be respectful of your time. If folks want to follow you, what's going on in your career, what's the best place to start, Mike? Uh, so on Instagram, you can hit me up, uh, the big fella, all one word, lowercase. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm not I'm not the biggest social media guy. Uh, and I found that, that a lot of guys my age in the 50s and their 50s, 60s, like, <laughs> they, um, it's, it's not my first go-to, but that's where you can find me. Uh, that's definitely where I engage the most, um, with everybody. So the big fella, uh, on Instagram, um, and I, I use TikTok here and there, but I, I'd rather not anyone waste their time trying to find me on that one. Awesome. Mike, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. No, Joe, thanks, man. It's so good to see you again, man. Oh, this is great. Thank you, brother. Good luck with everything. I, I mean, you are the, the prototypical New York working actor who's just like, have living their best life and i think most people would want to be movie stars but like if you can't be a movie star you want to be like a mike houston right yeah yeah i'll take that man i'll take that be like me be like mike but not that mike like this mike (laughs) thanks mike
All right, Joe. Thanks, buddy. Take care. And that's today's Good Listen. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note and tell me your story, you can write me, Joe Partavilla at ProtonMail.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, I would really appreciate it if you punched that big old thumbs up button. It's a small gesture, but it really helps my channel. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please leave a five-star review. That would be amazing. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I will see you next time. Adios.